I have to be honest, I'm from the suburbs. Just for those watching, I'm not from actually Chicago. I'll allow it. I grew up in the suburbs too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your time. What's up? It's Amanda Smith here with Sarah Spain. I had to rip my Cub shirt for you today. Nice. My Chicago sista so thank you for joining me i'm glad i'm glad to be here i'm glad you're repping the cubs too so about 10 years ago you're working in chicago and espn calls what was that initial feeling like for you well so i had met with the folks at the local radio station and espn chicago which was about to launch as one of a number of localized sites and i was just moving back to chicago from los angeles had a meeting with them. There was no opportunities, but I at least got face to face with some folks. And so it was about a year or so later that they had an opening uh, as an update anchor for the local radio station and called me in. And that was really cool for me because that was the first time, and it's been that way since, that I haven't had to go out for a job. It's come to me. And that's kind of when you know you've sort of started to make it a little bit. Now, I'm looking back and I hadn't made it in any way, but I had made it enough that they heard me doing some radio on another station and doing a local TV show and writing for a local blog site. And so they, they knew that I was around and they remembered having met with me and, and reached out. So um, I just remember the very first uh, update that I did and you could hear the Sports Center music and I'm Sarah Spain with your Sports Center update. I was like, oh my God, I'm on ESPN <laughs> now. It's, it's legit. <laughs> you know, from that, initial meeting that you had where there wasn't an opportunity and then later something presented itself how would you describe the importance of networking to young broadcasters maybe watching it's huge and i remember when i was oh, i still have my earpods and it works i, I like them they're like um, okay so good. 2019 I like, <laughs> I know, right? um you know uh i remember back when people would tell me it's who you know and how frustrating that would be when I was, you know, just out of college and living in LA, trying to make it no connections, no nepotism that I would have very much welcomed. And I was just <laughs> kind of flailing about, um, but it's true. And so if you don't naturally have a network because of friends or family or people in your, you know, collegiate alumni system that have hooked it up, you just have to go to as many things as possible. Say yes to every opportunity, whether it's paid or not, which I know for some people is easier than others, but if it's about going to a party with your friends or having the opportunity to volunteer to work at an event where you're gonna meet other people in the business, sometimes you make the decision for your career. Um, but yeah, going to conferences, going to networking events, reaching out to alumni from your school. I, for one, know that I'm much more likely to wanna to reach out and help somebody if they're also a Cornell alum or if they went to the same high school, if they're a Chicago, like if we have something in common, because I get a lot of requests and so it makes them stand out. So really making sure that you're using every possible networking outlet that you can find. Well, shout out to you for being on the Amanda Smith Show this week. <laughs> this is so I follow you on social media and I always see you posting about equal rights and different causes that you're passionate about. To you, why is it important to use your voice and your platform to be an advocate for progressive change in thinking? Well, it was just a couple years into working at ESPN 1000 where I sort of had to make that decision. I realized that there were times, especially when all male hosts, which is all there are there, uh, were making cracks at the expense of women or other people that if I had stayed quiet or if I had laughed, it would have made me just as likable to everybody out there listening who wants to, you know, grab a beer with me and talk sports, which is all I thought I wanted. And then, you know, once I had a little bit more agency and I found myself within the industry, not trying to get into it, I wanted to make a change. And you know, one of the things that stood out to me a couple of years ago that I heard that I think is so important to remember is people always try to accuse people with progressive views or who want to change an existing system as having an agenda. But it's as much of an agenda to want to keep things the same. If the reason that you want to keep things the same is because you want fewer women or people of color or LGBTQ people in a system, that's just as much of an agenda as wanting to fight for diversity of thought. It's just not characterized that way. It's the people who are kind of getting in the way of things staying the same, people who are talking about things and how they need to change. They tend to get you know, criticized for that, whereas the people who aren't willing to stand up for that or who even support keeping things the way they've always been kind of very same, you know, very deeply felt agenda. So um, the number one thing has always been fairness, right? And I'm not always going to be completely on the right side. I'm constantly trying to check within myself to see when I'm not being fair, when I'm taking advantage of things that are a, a privilege to me and not to others. But I think in the end, if our goal is always to say, is this fair to everybody? 
whether it's you know gender or race or sexuality is everybody getting a fair shot um and if they're not then why aren't we making that better that's always going to drive me more than just making sure people don't think that I'm annoying for bringing up women's issues or that they're sick of me, you know, talking about social issues in my sports. To those who will experience that sort of inequality, if you already have, or if you will, what would you say to them? I always say you have to have a thick skin, but know where to draw the line, especially for women in this industry. Um, absolutely, you don't allow sexual harassment or worse than that, right? There are things that you have to draw the line on, but early on, especially if you're in a whole room full of guys and you're the only woman, you pick your battles, right? You don't fight about every little um, joke or indiscretion or whatever, because it just separates you more and makes it more clear that you're different. I wish I didn't have to give that advice, but unfortunately, just because there are people that are great allies doesn't mean that everyone's boss is on the right side of things or everyone's coworkers are on the right side of things. And until you get a certain amount of power and agency, you could just be sabotaging yourself in terms of getting opportunities if you start off the bat a little bit too much on the side of I'm different, I'm standing out, here's all the ways I'm going to change the way you guys are used to things going. Um, and so I would say if, if you're on the wrong side of things, the best advice I got was just be so great that they can't say no. And so as I was dealing with some BS in the locker rooms of a couple teams here and dealing with some other reporters who um, treated me unkindly when I first got to Chicago, my my mentor said, you just have to be good enough that they can't say no. So I put my head down and worked and put out the best product, the best content until people can't say that you're not good enough, that you don't deserve to be here. And you get opportunities like ESPN that makes it a lot harder for people to say no when you show up with, you know, the biggest network and you've been given an opportunity because you've earned it. You know, when you talk about women's harassment, I would honestly say that you and Julie DeCaro are a part of one of the more powerful videos on the Internet it influenced me a few years back when it was shot where you let a handful of men read tweets that were actually sent to you to your face. Right. Why did you choose to be a part of that project? Um, you know, the Brad Burke who came up with the idea of it said that he would read an article once every couple months and everyone would be in an outrage after reading the terrible things that were being said to female sports reporters and women in sort of male dominated industries. But then they kind of get over it, right? They would read it and they would move on. And he wanted to find a more visceral way to really display what was happening. And as much as I don't want to be pigeonholed into, oh, that's the sports reporter who's always talking about, you know, Twitter trolls or sexual harassment or whatever else myself for those to be able to conversation going further advance the next day. I think people visually witness it was very different from just reading it. As sad as it may be, the fact that it was the men who were emotionally moved, while Julie and I were very stoic because it's something we've been used to and have grown a thicker and thicker skin over the years, seeing men be vulnerable and be emotional was really, I think, what was the trigger for people to be like, this is bad stuff. And, and unfortunately, I think in some ways, we're sick of hearing from women. We don't want to listen to women complain um, unfairly and and due to deeply, deeply upsetting social uh, generalizations and, and a patriarchal culture that's kind of like women lie and women whatever. Um, so when we hear men and see men being moved by these things, it triggers something differently, I think, for a lot of people. Well, I have to say that video, like I remember when I first watched it and it moved me. So thank you for being a part of that. And thank you yeah. for everything you do to stand up for, for those behind you and those in front of you and, and just everything in general. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to play a quick old game that I made okay. up. Now it's a play on Around the Horn called Around the Corn Midwest Edition. <laughs> so... NBA insiders have given six potential trade destinations for Russell Westbrook. Mm -hmm. On the list is Chicago. Sarah, mm -hmm. your thoughts? <laughs> uh, first of all, I love corn. Corn is like my favorite thing. So I would is love it? to be on, on the cob ball. or like separate? Like literally anything out of the can on the cob. <laughs> like I'll do anything. Um, uh, Russell Westbrook to the Bulls. Well, here's the thing. As, as a Bulls fan, we're constantly talking about how no big names want to come to Chicago and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And yet then we have this big name and we're all like, oh, I think we're good. Um, I don't know. I'd like to be relevant. I'd like to be relevant. I'd like to, I'd like to matter. I'd like to have our games be something I want to watch. I'd like to feel like they could ever just go after someone that other people want and get that person, even if that person might not be exactly what you want. 
So I'd be, I would love it for Russell Westbrook to come to the Bulls, mainly because I have absolutely zero expectations for them to ever be good anytime soon until they change their entire front office. So if this front office wants to screw up by getting a guy that might not help them win instead of screw up by just having zero players and, and, and signing contracts to guys that have no future, sure, let's try to screw up in a different way this time. <laughs> they honestly just break my heart recently. They're terrible. So it just yeah, hurts. Just, it hurts bad. me right now. You yeah. girl. The MLB trade deadline is approaching. Should the Cubs make a move? Yes or no and why? Sarah, you're up. <laughs> you're also the only one playing. Should. Yes. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, the Cubs <laughs> should absolutely make a move. Um, this is a weird team where it feels like they're more than talented enough, but something isn't clicking. And I think when you've got a team that's as talented as they are and when they are still kind of in first or close to first at all times with the Brewers close on their heels, even when they're not doing their best, it makes you feel like one little push, some little snap of the finger, something changing in there will help them. And we've seen them in the past have some really great second halves to a season after an early slump. So I, I think this is a team worth investing in. And I think this is still a window where it needs to be bye, 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 get whatever you can. That's all we have time for on this week's edition of Around the Corn. Thank you for playing. <laughs> Thank you, Corn and Alley. <laughs> so we had some awesome fan questions for you. So I want to get to as many as we can, get those questions answered. So Lindsay Smith, no relation to me, but former guest on the Amanda Smith Show. Hey, girl. Nice. Would like to know if you have any advice on how to negotiate a raise. I'm terrible at this. Oh my God, I'm <laughs> such a cliche. Uh, I'm terrible at this because I, that's why I got an agent. Uh, at the time that I had two offers, I was like, I immediately was like, I need an agent to help me with this because I don't know what either is supposed to pay. I don't know how to negotiate more from one or the other, um, which is a terrible answer and something that I would like be giving the sh finger to someone else <laughs> if I heard them say it. Um, but I would say it would be the same way I approach anything else, right? You would need to come with a very prepared set of, of proof as to why you deserve it, what your work has done, you know, why it's necessary, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I would ask someone who's asked for a raise before I send in the big guns to do that for me. All righty. Next up, we've got Jason Ross Jr. He says, I love Sarah's That's What She Said podcast retweet. <laughs> Favorite part of doing the pod. Oh, I just love getting to be a sort of like nosy neighbor slash therapist. It's like a combination of like, I get to ask all the questions that I always want to ask these people, find out how they got successful, what moves them, what drives them, you know, how they got to where they are. Um, and then I get to dive deep and, and in re regular radio, the, the interviews are so short or on TV, there's such a time crunch that I really can listen and react to what they say and then, and then ask follow-ups and dive deeper into, into who they are. I'm obsessed. <laughs> I'm an avid listener and follower, fangirling Aww, so hard. Thank okay, you. move on <laughs> before you hang up. On me. OGD Smooth says, before making it big on ESPN, did you ever doubt yourself or doubt that you'd ever get your big break? I did. I did. I, you know, I moved to LA originally to try to do comedy. I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live. And so I did the full Second City Conservatory and auditioned for all these acting things. And I didn't really have it. I was great at reading the scripts. I knew where the jokes were. I was good at the improv side. But I was really behind a lot of my classmates who had devoted all their high school and college years to drama and to theater. Um, and so I, I very much doubted then if I had even dreamed of the right thing and if I was meant to dream of it. And then when I moved my way into sports and started to feel more confident, even then I still felt like, oh, now I'm in, a, in the right spot. This makes sense for me to combine my love of entertainment and, and performing with my background in sports and my love of sports. Um, but it takes a while and you kind of have to do the fake until you make it in terms of confidence. You kind of have to consider yourself like if you were a real estate agent and you had to sell a house, you would tell people about all the wonderful things about it and why they should buy it. You have to consider yourself your product and you have to be able to show other people why you're so great, why you're deserving, even if you don't fully believe it at that point, before you get the validation of peers and fans and bosses and everyone else, you have to be the one who's kind of selling yourself. And so that was hard for me for a while, but um, it does get easier once you get those little opportunities because that's the validation you need to be like, okay, I'm on the right track. And that goes back to, I think, the networking you talked about earlier, too, putting yourself out there and creating, you know, a sort of little army that you can go to and get advice. And yeah. And Last question. Tim Rushi says, what is the best way for you to get reps early on? Oh, my God. You guys are so lucky now because I used to have to 
buy a DVD burner, borrow a camera, film a bunch of stuff at different events for my hosting reel, tr- pay an editor to edit those things into one piece, burn it onto a DVD, go home, burn those DVDs, put them in a mailer, snail mail them to somebody's office to try to get them to take a meeting with me. I mean, it's, it's crazy what I had to go to just to get my stuff out there. Now you have your phone. You can make a YouTube channel. You can make a podcast. You can do voice memos and send them. I mean, there's there's so many different opportunities for you. And I always tell people, especially people who want to be on camera, have a YouTube channel. Do what you're doing. But even if no one wants to watch and come on, which you've already nailed that part of it, you've got the guests, you've got people watching. If you're just starting out, go to YouTube. And if you have zero views every day, maybe that's for the best because you might suck and you need to get those reps out of the way before people watch and realize that you're no good yet. Um, But just go every day and say for five minutes every day, I need to do some on-camera work. I need to host a fake show. I need to, or even if you don't put it out in the world, you can just record it and watch it, figure out what your tendencies are, figure out what you need to work on. Um, As far as reps where you're working with someone else, um, those are tougher. Obviously you have to get an opportunity. You have to be an intern and then ask if they'll let you, you know, film something while you're there or something like that. My low battery keeps coming. That's why I'm pointing at the camera like a weirdo. Um, <laughs> no, I just, I just thought you were popular. Like, like, X, like X. <laughs> uh, a couple text messages, mostly low battery. Um, yeah. So, uh, I think, I think the reps are things that you can do at home by yourself. And also if you're asking someone like me for help, it can help if you say, here's two minutes of me. Let me know what you suggest and what you're, and what you think you'd give as tips. Don't send me 15 minutes. Don't send me a half hour. But if you send me a small amount, I can at least say, oh, you, you got this. Like, you're ready to go. Or this is what you need to work on. Um, so there's no excuse now not to get those reps. Yeah. Hashtag the internet. 2019. Yes. Right? We got our iPhones. <laughs> That's right. Oh. You can make a whole movie on your phone if you really wanted to. Exactly. No, but my Chicago land suburb sister, I have to thank you for being <laughs> on the show today. I've like had so much fun talking to you. I've been a fan of yours for so long. So thank you. Well, thanks for having me. I think you have a very it quality. You're natural at this. You're extremely likable. You're very fun. And I think you have a very bright future. You remind me of an up and coming Mina Kimes. I feel like I'm going to cry right now. And also, I, I really do. I cry about a lot of things, but especially when people complain. Well, and I mean I, it. I don't always say that quick to people. Story. I was in an elevator once, and I was at the NCAA tournament. And someone in the elevator turns to me and taps me on the shoulder, and he goes, I'm sorry, Mina. Um, <laughs> and I was like, he's like, yeah, Mina, uh, you you're Mina Kimes, aren't you? And I was like, <laughs> no, but is she here? Like, yeah, like where you point me in the right direction. <laughs> right? That's great. <laughs> That's so, great. Mina, hey, let's get you on the show, girl. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Send her a tweet. <laughs> well, you know I'm going to. No, but seriously, thank you so much again, and thank you for your kind words. You're welcome. Okay, guys, for Sarah Spain, I'm Amanda Smith, and we'll see you next time.